everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Risk Matrix. The Risk Matrix, Roll Tide, baby. <laughs> Roll Tide. And I'm here with James Junkin. He's my co-host here on The Risk Matrix, and I'm Dr. Uh, Martin. And today we've got a guest, but before we introduce our esteemed guest, um, James has got something to say. This episode of The Risk Matrix by Bear Force is sponsored by Predictive Safety. Predictive Safety was founded in 2009 with the mission to improve workplace safety, reduce risk, and boost productivity by predicting and managing worker fatigue and cognitive impairment. Predictive Safety products include two patented software as a solution-based applications called Alert Meter and Prism, as well as biomathematical shift schedule assessments. Alert Meter is a 60-second graphics-based test developed under the guidance of NIOSH. Used on any device, it measures an individual's cognitive alertness and compares their score to their own personal baseline. Visit predictivesafety.com forward slash Bearforce for more details on a special offer. Dr. Simon, you're in the matrix, baby. Hello, hello, hello. Oh. Um, so I'd like to formally uh, welcome you, Dr. Simon. Uh, today, James and I are, are blessed to have Dr. Simon Goncharenko with us. He is a uh, data center construction EHS uh, with Meta right now. Um, he's had other other lives and other jobs before that, um, but he's also a member of the Veriforce SAB board. Welcome, Dr. Simon, to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So just so our, our guests can kind of um, find out a little bit about you before we jump right into this, uh, and, and spoiler alert, we're going to talk about human performance today um, because that's kind of Simon's area of, of research, but Simon, can you tell us a little bit about your background, uh, you know, how you got from here to there, and um, what, what makes you passionate about safety? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so um, my last name, as you had mentioned, it is Goncharenko, and it's uh, pretty long, 11 letters long, and it also has that K-O ending, which kind of was a dead giveaway of a Ukrainian last name, so uh, which... Uh, uh, let you know, I guess, uh, that uh, I was born actually in the former Soviet Union uh, and uh, I kind of started my life there, came here for um, uh, around college age uh, to start getting some education and and uh, received my bachelor's, master's and then PhD. Um, and initially, my initial education was in the area of theology, which um, you kind of look at it and you go, what does that have to do with safety? You know, it's uh, kind of totally different field and it kind of seems that way. But over the last, um, I guess, 26 years of post-college um, life, post-college um, direction, I guess I am realizing more and more the connections between kind of my initial training and what I'm doing right now. And, and that connection really ultimately is my life has always been about helping people, right? And finding ways to encourage people, finding ways to direct people. And really uh, the life of ministry, if you will, and the life of a safety, um, there are a lot more connections that people would realize because in either one of those, um, you get to influence people. You have no authority, if you will, to authority that maybe a CEO has or you know an upper manager has to direct people and tell them you will do this this and the other you need to but you have to inspire and influence someone to do something that in the end is ultimately what they're after as well right everyone wants to go home safely and uh and 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 so how do you influence individuals to do that so that's kind of that's kind of the the connection that i have seen as far as just kind of but uh my background like i said i came here when i was about I uh, came to the U.S. when I was about 17 years of age, um, started college, um, then uh, right after college, uh, which was in Arkansas, went to Texas, um, got my master's, um, got married, and uh, I guess the rest is history. I um, started uh, working in the area of nonprofit and and uh, did some 
uh, work also in a couple of other industries. Uh, ended up in oil and gas, being in Texas and not crossing oil and gas industry is kind of an impossibility, I guess. And uh, from there, uh, veered into this whole area of data centers, uh, probably over the last seven years. And, uh, and that is where I stumbled uh, on the whole topic of human operational performance, uh, specifically within the context of data centers. But that's kind of in a nutshell, uh, a high level overview of kind of who I am and and where I've been, and I'm happy to dive into any of those areas if you guys well, want to. In I, specific Dr. Order. Simon, you you skipped a lot of your your experiences <laughs> in in your short biographical assessment of yourself, and you've had a very unique uh, career and life. Uh, and I'm inspired by a lot of uh, the stories you've told uh, to me over the years. And I'd like to back up to a certain point in time. Uh, because I think it informed a lot of your thinking when it comes to uh, safety and, and getting workers home safe from high hazard jobs. And you share that same vision that, that Verifor shares. But as a child, you, you were there during the Chernobyl incident, were you not? I was. And, and it's, that's a very actually good question because uh, growing up, uh, and that's an, a really interesting uh, topic in and of itself. Growing up, um, geographically speaking, um, I grew up about six hours driving time from the area where Chernobyl uh, explosion took place. And um, if you look back and kind of study uh, the context and the details, and some people might remember the HBO special that went on not too long ago, uh, focusing on that, uh, it was the prevailing winds uh, shortly after the disaster that was one of the major factors in how much radiation uh, I was not exposed to as um, I lived south uh, west, I guess, of the uh, area and the winds uh, during that area were going more uh, northwest uh, and more closer to the north. And that's the reason you know, folks as far as Scandinavian countries and even UK, their Geiger meters started registering things. And that's the reason Soviet Union, which was in the habit of not telling the truth as far as the media was concerned, was forced to reveal the information because the evidence was there. So, yeah, that's uh, definitely a very defining moment in, in uh, my background. And that's the first time that we hear the term safety culture. Mm hmm. That's very right. true. It's in uh, that they, report. That's correct. The investigations that came out of that was what kind of birthed that whole culture. I mean, that whole um, element. And I know that's uh, one of the favorite elements of yours as far as your life passion is concerned. That's right. <laughs> that's right. It is. It is. Even I'm not going to let him go down that. I'm not going to let him go down that road today, though. Between. Look, now he's starting to pout a little bit. Hey. Um, we're. we're <laughs> Between we're role tide and safety culture, those yeah. two terms find a way in any uh, interview, yeah. that done, don't they? Yeah, but we're not <laughs> we're not going to let him go down that road today uh, of safety culture. We might we might address it on a further panel on this show, but th that's okay um, because as you were talking about theology and how it relates to to safety, um, that would be something that I would love to have a conversation on at some point because my background's in geology and I can relate theology to geology. And so, I mean, we can get into that philosophical discussion, but I'm going to stop myself and not do that. Um, but it's a topic for another day. Um, what we really kind of wanted to, to talk to you about today, or at least start with it, is this concept of uh, how everybody's really focused on serious injuries and fatalities um, and how that curve is not uh, bending the way that we wanted to or as, as quickly as we wanted to and, and how people are looking for solutions um, and or pressure points to kind of push that curve lower. And so what I would like to ask you is what, what kind of is on the horizon for HOP in human performance and how does that relate to um, in influencing the SIF trend? Yeah, no, I think that's a, a big loaded question. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and just like you said about some of the other uh, conversations or some of the other topics, it's definitely something that we can be in for quite some time now. But I think 
you know, I think um, you definitely saw, you know, kind of set me up pretty good as far as the initial um, direction of this question. And that is, I do believe that where we have been in the, in the, on the topic of safety, and that's when it comes to the uh, more behavior based trends, um, I'm glad to see that we are uh, slowly edging away from that. I think the behavior based um, concepts uh, for two reasons, and there are a lot more reasons uh, why uh, I think it's time for us to move on. And one of those is because I think theoretically they're based on overly simplistic understanding of human behavior, right? Um, you can definitely influence a single cell amoeba uh, to do something that you wanted to do by rewards and punishment, but it's a lot more difficult to influence a 33 trillion cell human organism, right? There's just a lot more to it in addition to free will and um, I just don't feel like it and everything else. So that's, I think, one of the reasons why I'm really glad uh, for that movement away. But the second reason, I think, and the main reason, and that's kind of where I think your question really centers, is that the behavior-based approach really only centered on the uh, kind of the point of the needle, right, where the action took place. Usually by and large, your uh, middle to upper management of any organization was really not involved in the process because the idea was that it's the it's the operational folks, it's the ones that are actually doing the action, are the ones that need to be involved. And so, um, by the same token, I think our focus on um, human operational performance, uh, human factors, um, uh, human organizational uh, topics, I think it's a good step in the right direction when it comes to bending SIF curve. I really do. But I just the research that I've done and uh, the information that I've processed and the trends that I'm seeing, um, I think that even most of the ways that we're looking at the human operational performance, I don't think we go far enough. I think it's it's a good start. Um, I think a systematic way is a good start as well, but I, I'm just going to give you a couple of examples. I think uh, even looking at the uh, hot trends and what we're doing, I think we're still leaving out um, a lot of our off-the-job behaviors, a lot of our off-the-job decisions. And I think if you think about it, I mean, it's one body, right? I have only one body to do what I do at work. And it's the same body that I turn around and do what I do at home or off work, right? And most of our organizations go, well, I have no control over what happens off work. You know, that's not within the contract. That's not, you know, anything that I can do anything about. But the idea is that when we leave that off the table, there's a huge part of the overall human being that we're not impacting and therefore uh, I think that that's 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 one aspect where just uh, everything that we're doing right now, from at least what the literature that I'm seeing in the human operational uh, performance world, we're just not going far enough. I think there's more to be done. And I think when we start impacting that overall holistic entire human being, that's, I think, when we're going to start seeing a difference. I, I can get so on board gonna... with that. I can get on board uh -huh. with that. Now, let, let me ask you a question right? Not to talk over Dr. Martin. When going back uh, a little bit to some of the things that you said uh, to align uh, with the behavioral approaches to uh, safety management systems, uh, I think we've done a really good job over the last 30 years of driving down OSHA recordable injuries. And maybe that's through training, through more uh, enforcement. Certainly that's the area of, of OSHA. Uh, beginning in the early 1970s, behavior-based safety. But I, I've sort of adopted this theory, I'd like you to uh, respond to it, that the same things that prevent OSHA recordable injuries are not necessarily the same things that prevent serious injuries and fatalities. And when we're looking at designing work, we have to think about the human being that's involved in the work. Human beings make mistakes. So I'd like you to respond to that just in, in the concept of uh, transitioning from a behavioral approach to more of a systematic approach. Do you agree with that? No, I absolutely agree with that. I think a lot of the things we're doing, you're, you're absolutely right. We're not considering that. I mean, even 
the term human error, right? And and the fact that to this day, no matter what organization we work for, you know, when we have an unwanted event, be it an injury, uh, property damage, um, you know, fatality, um, whatever that may be, we always, you know, get together and we have our uh, investigations and we're trying to determine, you know, root causes. And a lot of times, you know, if we're not careful, um, we seem to be settling down on this whole human error concept, which really, I mean, it's it's really kind of a lazy um, stop, I guess. It's it's not truly going down. And, you know, it's interesting. I see a lot of parallels. The more research I've done, I see a lot of parallels with uh, with the, the SIFs and, and what you're talking about with the highway fatality um, numbers, right? So in the United States, uh, for example, our highway fatality numbers have kind of been at the same point uh, for the last 60 years. And it's been a really interesting trend. And so if you look at that, those numbers um, in a more lazy way of not truly considering the entire context, you can say, boy, you know, over the last 60 years, we've really not been able to move the needle on the highway incidents or highway deaths in the United States. And that's part of the story. But if you look at the number of cars that is on the road today versus 60 years ago, you get more of a story. But the interesting thing and the reason I brought that parallel is because, you know, um, one of the things that highway safety and we we are implementing in that area that we really need to start, I think, implementing in the in the uh, safety, industrial safety and in, in human uh operations is this whole idea. I mean, think about one of the preventative controls, right? Think about those uh, uh, rumble strips on the highways. You know, what's our safety equivalent of a rumble strip? Because a rumble strip is there because it assumes, back to your question, James, it assumes that humans are going to make errors. And so that's a control that's placed there to right get you back on into your lane um, because the idea is that the errors are going to be there. And, and and a lot of times, I think we understand that theoretically, but we're still trying to prevent human errors, as opposed to accepting the fact that humans are fallible. And fact of the matter is, is that each and every one of us makes mistakes. They even have a study that says, you know, the difference between office-based personnel and field-based personnel, and how many errors each of them makes in an hour. So there's a study available out there, and it tells you that that's just fact of life we just instead of trying to prevent those what we ought to do is minimize those but also introduce controls that will allow those errors to not end up in serious injuries and fatalities where does free will come into play when designing a safety management system and in human performance sure no i understand 100 percent. i apologize again for uh asking you to repeat um, it's, it's, I think it's, uh, it's another one of those, uh, topics that I think we can spend a little bit of time, uh, going down, but the idea is that again, um, free will, I think is theoretically, if you think about it, you know, as a human being, um, I can get up in the morning and this is kind of what I, I think where I was going down, uh, there is I can get up in the morning and I can know all the facts. I can cite the research. I can produce the evidence. And at the end of the day, you know, uh, I can still not feel like doing something. Right. And so that's that idea. That's the concept that's very different in the world of amoebas. Right. Amoebas uh, function. They will operate in the way that you're prodding them to operate. And that's kind of the difference between an amoeba and a human being. And that's I think that whole concept of free will. So to me, you know, how do you compensate for that? Well, um, I think that's where. Um, every organization that I've ever worked with or advised, I guess, um, you know, that's where this whole idea of collecting evidence and um, that's the whole idea of near misses. You know, um, we focus so much on serious injuries and fatalities because we think that's our best data uh, gathering event. But in my opinion, I think that those are great, but I think where you get a lot better data is your everyday, you know, uh, events like near misses. Because near miss is the most incredible data point that your organization collect because here's a perfect illustration of possibly human free will being expressed. And yet the controls that you have in your organization worked and prevented that event from 
uh, from, you know, uh, working out as a full blown incident fatality or injury or whatever. And so that's, um, that's the kind of thing that you want to study. So um, every organization has different uh, control points that can be introduced. But I think those are the ones that are saying, okay, we're recognized free will, we recognize that everyone makes mistakes. And what are the guidelines that we can put into place? Um, and I mean, and if your question was really dealing directly more directly with what are some of those guardrails? You know, they differ from industry to industry. You know, um, and and certainly, I think that uh, collecting evidence based on the near misses is certainly one of those guardrails. Well, you know, I've said this a, a million times, and I'd like to take take credit for it. But you know, Doc, uh, Fred Manuel informed a lot of my thinking when it comes to safety management systems because I began my career in the behavioral side of the house and that's how I was trained and I've sort of transitioned uh my my way of thinking into you know hazards are best controlled in the design and planning stage of the work because that accounts for uh the potential for you to catch uh areas where human beings can make mistakes so we can say like your rumble strips hey People are going to be sleepy. People are going to be inattentive. People are not going to uh, be talking on their cell phone or answering texts or whatever when they're driving. So we have a rumble strip on both sides of the highway to alert people to be able to get back into their lane and to and, and, and to ho hopefully operate their vehicle safely. So in, in my opinion, when we're talking about human performance, we're talking about the rumble strips of safety, right? And the best place to put the rumble strips in is when we're planning the work. If we design the potential for human error into the work itself, human beings will find it. Absolutely. Human beings will find it. Now, the second part of that, and I think it's what Dr. Martin's alluding, alluding to when we get into free will, there is not a safety management system in the world that can account for, I don't care. Right? Dr. Martin. I just want to I just want to put in here before you finish that thought, James, that I I feel the rumble strip for free will, or at least the 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 guidelines, the 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 things that make us not swerve off the road is our organizational culture. And, and I think I think you can you can build that around people. They're still going to have some semblance of free will, but but. If you have a strong organizational culture, now I'm not talking safety culture, I'm talking organizational culture, that if people people know what the norms and and the ethics and everything that is involved in, in what you do, you may be able to weed out a lot of the free will because they're going to make right choices, right? But there's also, as James said, there's also going to be somebody that just doesn't care, right? Well, but But the rumble strip is your culture. Yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. And I think what, really what you're saying, I mean, we're coming right back around to the whole one of the uh, foundations for human performance, if you will, and that is human variability, right? Because if you think about it, what we had done over the last 30, 40 years and behavior based approaches, we try to minimize human variability. We created our uh, safety manuals, we created our SOPs, MOPs, whatever, if you will. And we try to force everybody, channel everybody, everybody into this minimal variability from our, you know, from this direction, from this way of doing things. And I think uh, what human organizational performance is doing is it's coming around and saying, actually, the human variability is where a lot of those strips happen, those rumble strips happen, right? Your humans are... Um, you know, and, and, it, and it all goes back to assumptions, really. I mean, if you think about it, because even human, even free will, right? It, what do you, what do you, what, you know, we, we started at the very beginning, even before you guys hit record, we were talking about culture and we we're talking about safety culture, right? But really, as with anything else, you got to define terms, right? I mean, I always say this, that if you have an argument with someone, the argument a lot of times is one at the stage of defining terms. And a lot of times you may engage in a conversation and you may lose the conversation before you ever start because you operate with two different definition of terms. So why am I saying this? Well, back to free will. Is free will, does free will have a negative connotation behind it? In your mind, it may. It may mean 
you know, you may by saying that you may mean that a that's a it's a departure from the recognized ways or you know the uh way that we want you to operate within this organization but free will may also mean a desire by humans to succeed even if they have to go off the reservation right and that that goes back to the whole human variability you know is it a bad thing is it a good thing and be, be, behind all that i think lies your worldview really is our um do you think that uh your organization consi consists of individuals that are constantly trying to screw you over, if you will, and take advantage of you? Or do you think that your organization consists of individuals that basically want to do a pretty good job? Right. And and they're going to leverage uh, the experience that they have and sometimes vary from the expected ways of doing things because they think at the end that's going to get them to the desired outcome in the safest way. Possible. And that's one of my that's one of my objections and changing my way of thinking over the years from a behavioral approach to safety, because that looks at, at workers as something that needs to be fixed. And if I could only fix the worker, if I could only get into the mind of the individual worker and motivate that worker and do these things to the worker, and we almost see the worker as as the antagonist in this and they're not the workers are greatest asset that's how we get uh jobs completed and sometimes i think when we're designing work and we're thinking about work we act like the world is very linear mm -hmm. and work is linear and and every day is static and mm -hmm. human variability look that's where innovation comes that's where we learn to yeah. do the job better more efficient you know, the business of business is business, so to speak. So if I can do it more efficiently and at a less cost, then, you know, there's where innovation comes and we won't get that in a static work environment. Uh, that can also be innovative around occupational safety and health. But at the same time, there has to be some rumble strips when it comes to safety. Now, I'd like you to respond to this because a lot of these things that we're talking about are being actively debated and have been actively debated in the academic circles of occupational safety and health for years or within organizations that have a tremendous amount of resources and assets to be able to design work. So where could, let's say, the safety professional go that has a hundred people within their company that that is is challenged every day. They're doing training, they're doing incident investigation, they're doing drug testing, they're doing field assessments, they're writing policies and procedures. You know, their day is full, and they've heard of these terms, uh, hop and et cetera, but they really don't know where can they go to learn more about it, number one. And how can a safety professional begin to move from a behavioral approach to a, uh, a human organizational approach and a systems approach to safety uh, with limited resources? That's, that's a really good question. Uh, you know, though, um, our research, and by the way, before I answer to that question, I wanted to point out something else that you had mentioned also, and that is, you know, if you think, think about it, interestingly enough, um, with the business of business being doing business, right? Um, that human variability in the course of that business, um, those same decisions, that same variability may be recognized, applauded, and even rewarded when the outcomes are good. And then we turn around and that exact same decision making, thinking and actions can be uh, a fireball offense and the outcomes different, right? So it, that, that's what we need to recognize is, is those are the exact same behaviors that accomplish us that increase in productivity, increase in efficiency, increase in, you know, whatever it is, increase maybe in the time that it takes to uh, operate something. And so, um, but, but back to, you know, the, the, the question that you did ask, um, the good news about living in the age of internet is we have so much information that is so easily available at our fingertips. I mean, literally, um, it's it's all out there. It doesn't have to cost much. I think um, looking at Conklin and Decker and Reason, I think those are three of the great resources that you can get into um, that can give you kind of a, a good overview initially. Uh, there are lots of other names uh, that are good out there, but I think those three would be a great start as far as the world of um, human operational performance. Um, that's certainly where I kind of cut my teeth in, in, in this area uh, 
um, human factors. And, um, you know, the, the, I think I look at that kind of um, in any in industry pretty much uh, one of the uh, industries that we celebrate. And I look at the picture behind you, James, and that's a picture of a U.S. submarine. And uh, United States uh, nuclear. It's an LHD. I no, it's back back over back. on the other side. Is it not a submarine on the other side of your? Uh, oh, that's my, uh, that's my ship. I'm talking tonight. Okay, all right. Well, it looks like a submarine, but either either way, I uh, really um, it's my point still stands, and that is U.S. nuclear navy has been one of the industries that, uh, whether you're in oil, gas, or data centers, you kind of point towards it. And you go, you know, they've done something right because they've operated in critical environments for the last seven, eight decades without any significant back to the original question of significant injuries and fatality, right? Um, um, what is it that they've done? That is one of the questions that actually got me going down this path. I started looking at them, and I'm like, what has the U.S. nuclear Navy done, right? And you can start kind of looking down the road, and like, okay, they have a very regimented schedule. They control what you eat, when you eat, how much you eat. They control when you sleep, how much you sleep. You know, they have protocols for everything, right? And so it's, it's, some of those things are, are impossible for us to completely and totally uh, reproduce in a, in a civil environment or, or you know, in a civil civilian life. But, but the other yeah, thing that's, that's been really, really interesting to me is I look at the Air Force, I look at the Army, I look at the Navy, and, and over the last uh, 50 plus, 50 plus years, years, same with the Department of Energy, Energy um, uh, they have they introduced, introduced both the, the human factors, factors concepts of training, training and, and understanding and into, into their operations, operations where they've, they've integrated right on that. And it's interesting because, because you know, you can say that, oh, well, human operation operations performance is a new kid on the block when they've been around, around 10, 10 years, years, you know, but, but you, you look, look at the Navy, Navy you look at the Air Force, Force, you look at the Army, Army and they've been operating that way for, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, you look at the nuclear energy industry, the Department of Energy, and all those concepts are there. So that's kind of an indirect way of saying, hey, hey, Lots of information available on the internet. Um, um, if you just do enough research, um, uh, there's a lot. And, and, and it even goes to the same thing that better. You know, they, they, they give some very specific down to earth initial steps of what, what you do to start a transition in anything, right? right? And, and really, um, um, you know, this goes back to the, the, the uh, 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 podcast that I, I uh, recently started, and I thought about what do I, what do I call it, right? Uh, because, because I wanted to talk about culture, I wanted to talk about performance, I wanted to talk about safety. And at the end of the day, I asked myself to hold the leadership chair here down because um, in my mind, it has to do with the leadership. I think that's where, um, um, you know, uh, John Maxwell gets it. It's absolutely right. right. And, and because as, as the leadership goes, so goes the organization, right? right. And so, so um, that's, that's what that would be my advice. advice. You know, you know, you those safe, safe professionals, professionals find myself kind of in the middle of the commitment. Of it. Um, um, do your research, research understand what you're talking about, about and then, then uh, uh, really the transition has to begin with the leadership. There, 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 there has to be a buyout at that level. Because at the end of the day, day you know, back, back to your favorite talk about the safe culture, culture. Um, um, whether, whether there is uh, something, something like that, that out there, there or not, but we both both great culture. Um, um, again, the leadership, leadership, you know, they're, they're the ones, ones that, that will, will uh, uh, settle, settle or will initiate, yeah, yeah, right? right. Someone, Someone says, says that cultural community policies are correct, correct, and I think that's very true. true. Um, I've worked for an organization, I've worked for an organization, organization, organization where, 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 you know, you know the, the, the legal legal department will give you all the policy guidelines, procedures, and the first day of the job, you understand the whole thing that goes on the because there is a culture there that expects you to do X, Y, and Z. Man, man, it gives you a culture, culture, it gives our nerves. That's very true. It gives you a culture, it gives our We're almost out of time. I'm not going to say thank you for joining us today. today. If you, you would, tell us where, where we can find the podcast. It's very, very interesting. interesting. I think a lot, a lot of people learn, learn a lot about human organization, human organization or more from, from, from my podcast. Yeah, no, I don't know. So it's on a buy by the motion paradigm. I say safe for performance, performance all culture. And uh, uh, you can look, look it up by that, that, that name. name. Look it up by my, my, my name. I just, just started. started. Uh, it it uh, in the last uh, month and a half, half or so. So I just kind of started starting the journey. Really, really want to focus on a lot of different aspects. I think, like you guys were saying, there are a lot of these things that we are not even realizing can be really in the end. Contribute to us being able to do it right. Yeah, 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 yeah.
Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Joy Schwenko, thank, thank you so, so much, much for coming, coming on, on our show. show. Um, um, for, for anybody who's watching, watching this or has watched it part or all the way through, all the way through, if you have any questions, questions pop, pop them in the chat on the YouTube channel or, or on the LinkedIn post that we make. Um, um, please, if, if, uh, uh, if you like what we're doing, doing click, click like, like. Even if you, if you don't like doing it, doing, click like, like. And, and follow us and subscribe on YouTube uh, because, because there's more where this came, came, came from. So uh, thanks, thanks, thanks everybody for listening, listening to the Risk Matrix with James Junkin and our guest, uh, uh, Dr. Simon Gajarenko. And, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. time.